Well, uh, Valetidio is a accomplished politician. Uh, he's also an accomplished regional di- diplomat. So he was previously, quite some time ago, the Attorney General in Tuvalu. But since then, he's held a, a range of very senior positions across a variety of organisations, including the Pacific Islands Forum, but also a, a range of organisations which essentially govern fishing ar- around the Pacific and also the way that revenue from those fishing grounds, of course, tuna is a critical part of the the revenue that the Pacific leans upon, is divvied up between countries uh, and organisations. So no one is doubting uh, his credentials for the job. The fact that he's got a good couple of decades at the peak of various regional organisations, as well as deep experience in Tuvalu politics, uh, and also previously as a, as a member of the uh, the, the government of uh, Tuvalu, seems to indicate that he's an extremely accomplished and well-credentialed person to take the top job. Well, what do we know about uh, Mr Teo's stance on the Falapili Union with Australia and how his leadership might impact bilateral relations? Yeah, well, obviously, this is a, a critical question for Australia, which, uh, as you know, signed the Falapilli Union with Tuvalu last year in uh, the Cook Islands. And just to remind viewers, this is the uh, the critical agreement that has been struck between uh, Australia and Tuvalu, which will essentially see a, a residency pathway opened up to, to people inside Tuvalu in exchange for security guarantees. So under the Falapilli Union, every year Australia will agree to settle up to 280 people from Tuvalu. Now, that isn't explicitly because of climate change, but both Tuvalu and Australia have acknowledged in their their public commentary that climate change and the fact that Tuvalu, a a low-lying country, faces existential threats from that uh, is a key component of the rationale here. If Tuvalu does go underneath the waves, the people of Tuvalu will need somewhere to go. And Australia is essentially offering to gradually resettle at least some members of that community in uh, in Australia. Uh, the, the corollary of that is that Australia essentially gets veto power over any security agreements that Tuvalu may or may not want to sign in the future. Now, one of the people contesting the leadership here, Anele Sopoanga, a previous Prime Minister of Tuvalu, had made it very clear he was very hostile to the union and and basically indicated that if he was to become Prime Minister, he would tear it up. Uh, And so that's why Australia was watching so closely. Now, Fleti Teo, what does he make of the agreement? Well, we don't know for absolute certain because he hasn't yet opened his mouth about it since taking the top job uh, just a couple of days ago. But there are a few clues which I think are giving Australia quite a bit of reassurance. Now, on the top of that list is the fact that Folletti Teo was one of the three eminent persons that was selected by the government of Tuvalu to advise it on the Falapilli Union or to come up with options in terms of discussions with Australia for resettlement. That process culminated in the Falapilli Union. So at least to some degree, he is the author or one of the authors of that agreement. Uh, if not the specifics, then at least conceptually the broad base basis for it. So Australia obviously is feeling pretty confident that now he's Prime Minister, it's going to be very unlikely that he's going to dump the Falapili Union. He's much more likely than Anele Sopawanga to be a supporter of it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will go through unamended. Uh, There has been quite a bit of pushback in Tuvalu around that section, which essentially gives Australia a veto power over its security arrangements. So it is possible that the new Prime Minister will still want to take another look at that and potentially amend that language. But if you're sitting in Canberra, um, you'd much rather be dealing with Valetti Teo than someone like an L.A. Sopawanga. And you'd have to say, of all the main leadership contenders, he's the one that is least likely uh, to make any sweeping or, or large amendments to the pact. So Australian diplomats and ministers will be taking an awful lot of comfort from that. And lastly, Stephen, on a somewhat lighter note, posts on one Pacific social media account have been going viral. We've finally learned who's behind it. What can you tell us? Yeah, Yvonne, this is a really extraordinary story. It was only a week or so ago that uh, people really started to notice the uh, what appeared to be the official account of the government of Kiribati. Uh, which uh, was engaging in some hilarious and very light-hearted banter uh, with uh, with people on uh, on the uh, website X, formerly known as Twitter. 
Uh, in particular, when one member of the public uh, mocked the fact that there was a, a town called Banana in Kiribati, along with London and Paris, uh, they replied acerbically, fine, don't visit then, which generated an enormous amount of, of likes. I, I can't remember the final number, but uh, several million people saw it. And I think some more than 500 or 600,000 people liked it as well. So it looked like the uh, the uh, official account of Kiribati had broken loose of all of the normal rather stuffy conventions of social media for governments and was actually engaging with people in a lighthearted and uh, amusing way. Uh, and as a result, it went from just a couple of hundred followers to uh, tens of thousands in a in a heartbeat. Uh, then, of course, the speculation started. Who was behind the account? It looked like an official one. So could it have been the government of Kiribati? Uh, I heard a rumor that it was uh, someone in the president's office, but it turns out that was not the case. It's the handiwork of someone who's actually uh, Kiribati, who has the background in Kiribati, but uh, is an American uh, citizen, uh, is actually based in Utah, uh, and who had actually pitched to do a bit of work for the government of Kiribati before, had been rejected, uh, still had his hands on the handle that had been set up by the government or for the government of Kiribati a few years ago, and was simply making merry in an incredibly lighthearted and effective way. Um, now, it'll be fascinating to see. He's actually since announced that he's in at least what he called early tentative discussions with Kiribati about whether he might actually keep the handle and make it an official one for the government. Um, but what the entire episode does demonstrate, I think, is that there is a real hunger out there for real engagement, uh, for wit, for banter, for a sense of humour. Uh, and for originality uh, out there on platforms like X. And when governments or individuals uh, do that, then unsurprisingly, they tend to get rewarded. It's a lesson I hope that the government of Kiribati, but not just the government of Kiribati, that I hope that every government around the world takes to heart. It's a good lesson for all, I guess, and social media, amazing things happen there. Stephen Jejet, thank you so much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me, Yvonne.